everything changed the moment I set foot in that formation. I was struck by this real feeling that I was in, not alone, that there was something there watching us. It really did feel like this is not part of your everyday world. This is uh, an interloper. Do you know what I mean? I'm reminded of um, a man who came from France and he said to me, my job is I do tours to the old ancient sites and I take people to the Sinai, to the mound there where Moses, you know, saw the burning bush. That's 5,000 years ago. And I said to him, well, that's fantastic. Here, we have one burning bush every day. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Deep Marathon. Download Veli now. This circle, which became known as the Pi Circle, after it was decoded by a retired astrophysicist, was the beginning of the investigation for us. It made everything else possible. And from that point on, any circle we found could potentially have a message for us in it, because it was the first definitive example of a formation in which geometric information had been encoded. In all the millennia of human history, pi has never been expressed in 10 slices that way. The idea behind it was almost more special than the actual execution of the design itself. I had really hoped that if Charlie went to England and found a crop circle and had a chance to walk around inside of it, that that would somehow help him get it out of his system. But in fact, it just made things worse. So once we returned to Los Angeles, um, I went into pre-production with the intention of returning back to England the next season. circles, as I understand them, are primarily in Somerset and Wiltshire, which was, of course, right next to where our school was in Glastonbury. Glastonbury in itself, I, you know, I think we all felt there was a very special feeling, for want of a better word there. It was sort of coming like coming back home in many respects, I think, for Charlie. Growing up there, these circles were forming around us and we were oblivious as children. So returning to England um, to shoot the film, I had a very clear goal in mind. I wanted to make contact. The very first design that I saw in 83, what amazed me at that time, I was so uh, uh, magnetized, uh, pulled to this, this formation. It meant something to me personally, and yet I'm watching every other car passing. They're glancing because they're seeing activity or they're seeing the, the circle, looking back at ahead, and driving on, just like nothing happened. At the same time, I could hear this clicking, like a tick, 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 of the plants lifting, lifting up, which kind of gave me the impression that this had only happened just recently, maybe minutes ago, maybe a few hours ago, and still that very special feeling. Uh, it's never left me. I adore Colin, he's like your favorite uncle. He's the father of the phenomenon. He's the first guy to have stepped out of his vehicle in the early 80s and said, what the hell is that there in the field? Um, which is why I'm making this film. So before we even um, set foot in England, there were approximately 15 to 20 circles that had already been created. So we were playing catch up from the moment we landed in England. They're not signposted, these crop circles, and uh, they're not on any maps. Ah. 
dude. Is this it? Back to the, um, which one? I don't think it's in this field, guys. getting scrambled every day now for new circles. It's really exciting. Colin Andrews was telling us, you know, he hasn't felt this way for years. We still hadn't been in a brand new fresh circle that was so important to us. Previous visitors have destroyed a lot of the physical evidence that we need. How was this circle made? Um, what are the mechanics of the lay of the crop? Um, you can't do that. It's like a crime scene. You can't do it if you show up and, and it's already become a tourist attraction. The question of who is making these crop circles, that's of course what everyone wants to know. We can speculate and there's a lot of speculation. Now we have the tendency to look outside of ourselves. We have done that throughout the ages. When you go to the crop circles, many people will do the same thing. They will point outside, it's ET, it's coming from another planet, another star system and it's going to help us. And they come from a very high level of consciousness. I'm absolutely sure for myself, based on my own personal experience, that we are dealing with a genuine phenomena that involves paranormal intervention. Probably extraterrestrial species that is working with human consciousness. I think actually it's much closer. It's not that far away. And deep down, I'm convinced it's actually somehow us. It can be us from the future or from the past, but on a very deep level, we are talking to ourselves. Now, crop circles really is a very difficult thing to talk about sensibly without sounding like you're a complete lunatic, because they are very odd, odd things. And of course, most people just default to the, uh, oh, they're being done by, by people. So therefore, there's nothing very odd about them at all. And, all complex formations are made by people. They're inspired, or some of them are inspired by something other than human intelligence, but I don't think that any of the flattening of the corn is done by anything but stomping boards. Wiltshire really is the epicenter of the crop circle phenomenon. The farm that gets hit the most with crop circles is owned by a family called the Carsons. Crop circles had only really been documented in the media throughout the late 70s, 80s and well just into the 90s at that point 
However, I've got family members, living family members, who were on this farm years before I was born, who remember seeing them. The, the circles that we saw starting in the 50s and probably going on into the 70s um, had absolutely no tracks going into them. Um, so it never occurred to us at that time that they were man-made. Well, th th this hoaxing uh, business, it, 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 it just goes on, you know, and clearly we have to look at it. Do I know any hoaxers? Um, yes, I have, have met a few. Generally, they're not the people who I would assume can make these patterns which require the geometry that a number of mathematicians find hard to even draw on a bit of paper. Some of the ones we were looking at in the early days were extremely well thought through and well designed. And using those principles again and again does require a certain amount of deliberate attention to detail that I doubt someone stumbling around in the middle of the night in four hours of darkness on a wet British evening without leaving muddy footprints all over the place could possibly pull off. I have been there when some of the most beautiful and complex designs have been constructed. I know all the tricks that are used to do things to say, oh, that's impossible. You couldn't possibly do it. The ambient light is extremely limited. It's not easy to work with a, a person next door to you, right next to you, let alone a quarter of a mile away from you, working on some geometry that you're constructing. These guys that make the cropsicles, they know exactly what they're going to do. They don't have to talk at night, they don't need flashlights at night. They just go and bang, they do it. And uh, we, are, we are told from virtually whoever looks at this in, in the biology field, that there are changes that cannot be replicated uh, by human feet. The BLT research team from America, they did a bit of research and they found that they went to a crop circle site where one had appeared the year before. And so they went back to that site just to have a look at the field to see what was going on there and found that all the crop there was growing much stronger, had more yields. So something during the creation of the crop circle or just the crop circle being there had actually stimulated the corn and the crop to grow better and to produce more yield. When I germinated some of these seeds, Notice the control here. You've got plants that are short, very short. Here are the formation plants, and you can see the tremendous difference. These are very, very much healthier, more vigorous plants. The embryogenesis in the seeds have been drastically altered. So for, uh, for about 25 years, hoaxes had a monopoly on crop circles. But there is one element that we find in some circles that completely negates the hoaxer angle. It makes them effectively um, redundant. Oh! Blood node! Woohoo! Even on the physical aspect, it's not explainable. How do you explain that? How do you explain that it affects the plants? How do you explain it changes composition of the soil? It's completely out of this world. That's why nobody believes in it. I'm really not an expert on these so-called expulsion cavities. I, I think obviously you would need a scientist to, to really comment on this. In the literally thousands and thousands of control plants that I've examined, I've never found a node expanded outside the range of the normal population anywhere to the degree you find in the crop formation. Nor have I ever, ever found an expulsion cavity because there's no way in hell that you can just go into a field and hoax those. They can't be hoaxed. The damage is internal, it's not external. The plant has been hit with some kind of radiation, possibly microwave energy, and the um, water within the knuckle of that plant, it's usually the apical node, has been superheated. Um, it heats up so fast um, that it has nowhere to go, highly pressurized, and what it actually does is it blows out the walls of the plant knuckle. Oh, wow. Look at, oh my God. I've never seen blow nodes like this, guys. If you look here, almost every single one of these nodes, these joints here, has, has been blown apart this is probably the most excited you'll ever see a man getting in a wheat field. Uh, these are the biggest I've ever seen. These knuckles literally got blown apart by some kind of energy. This is a control. We're 50 yards outside the circle. 
This is from the center of the circle. See how the knuckle has just been totally devastated. To me, this is proof that this has not been boarded. This is something that boards have never done, never will do. There's no way you can hoax that. So once you've established there's a human element there uh, in the hoaxing, then, uh, then obviously the next step is to go out into the fields at the same time they're there and try and catch them. It's the night vision. How do you feel about the stakeout? Ooh, I'm excited. <laughs> Stick out. Looking for hoaxes or aliens. I've been out of here about an hour and a half now. The mist is getting thicker. Sheep on their way to breakfast. That was stunningly fantastic. But other than that, we stuck it out. We did the whole night. Can't ask for more than that, and we'll keep at it until we find them. I see about four people. They're, st they're stomping or something. There's two se two sets of twos, man. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna head them off. surprised to see us kind of pop out of the bushes we were surprised that they were Spanish backpackers so everyone was surprised really so, so the interesting thing about crop circles over the years is that if you look at it objectively from a distance what it looks like is happening is that we're being taught a language rather like children and even if you go further back in time where there were no written documents, um, we find crop circles mentioned in folk, uh, fairy tales and folklore all over the world. We find them in Central Europe in old tales. We find them even in the legends of the Native American in Northern America. We're basically talking plants that have been laid flat in a field. It's that straightforward. And yet, over the years, the designs have become more and more complex. So from that on, we can clearly say, OK, there is a phenomenon that started with simple circles and showed a geometrical evolution up to the very pictorial and big complex patterns of today. Which are vast in size, from the 65 feet to a whole array of complex designs that measure up to three quarters of a mile across. And the bit that I find really intriguing is uh, the fact that I'll fly over there at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening and then come back in the morning um, and there is a large formation that can be three or 400 feet long and it's very, very complex. Could it be extraterrestrials trying to make contact with us? Most, if not all, of the patterns 
I am afraid to say I'm, I'm convinced are made by people. It's ironic that Peter arrived in England about 15 years prior as a believer in crop circles and people describe him from that time as being a very joyful, um, loving, happy-go-lucky individual, which is very different from the somewhat tragic figure we bumped into when we went to England. I hope that Peter comes full circle and is able to find the wonder and mystery in that part of the world again. When you make a circle, let's say like Barbary Castle uh, 2008, which you told me you were involved in, did you actually... Uh, oh, last year, yeah. Yeah. Did you actually... How did you come up with that design? I'm sorry, we're on camera now. I can't claim to be involved with the oh, illegal... Oh, I see. So, so you didn't make that one? This has just been crushed. It's just been pressed to the ground. Totally crushed. And again, here, all kinds of damage. Green stick fractures. There's nothing supernatural about this. That's been done with a board. So a serial artist is essentially, it's also known as a hoaxer. It's someone who goes out in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness. It's amazing, actually, what they can accomplish. There are some remarkable formations that we know a man made. In the summer of 1991, which was actually when I joined the UFO project, there were a number of quite spectacular pictograms being reported in the fields. Um, the storm broke, I guess, in um, the autumn of that season when the Daily Express ran a front page headline exposing the activities of two amiable chaps, Doug and Dave, who effectively put their hands up and said, we did it. We've been hoaxing the world. Uh, we are the two guys who've been making these crop circles with planks of wood, bits of string, and a sight made from a bent piece of wire on, on a baseball cap. When people say all crop circles are made by those two old blokes, Doug and Dave, the first thing we say today is, well, one of them's been dead for over ten years. So it's probably not him now. And the formations they made for cameras were very unimpressive, very messy, they really bore no resemblance to the, the level of complexity that we had been used to seeing and that they were claiming by insinuation. While I was in Wiltshire, um, I decided to reconnect with um, some very dear old friends who I'd grown up with in the area, and we decided to do that in a crop circle. Um, in hindsight, probably not the smartest idea given um, what transpired. Good board work if it is that. I mean, look at that. They're doing this in the dark, you know. And that is scorching there. All right, and it's all over them. That's just nothing. Just no, 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 no. Hold that. All right, well, let's I'll go make. and break some corn, yeah? Hey. We'll break some corn and see. Well, and, and no, you it. have not got nothing. You've got a blown node. <laughs> He's got let's a blown look. node. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look. Yay. And what are you seeing here? Can you explain what you see? I'll show you, I'll show you a normal one. I don't really see anything, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> it could get crushed, yeah? yeah? Over it goes. So immediately these nodes start to adjust themselves to the sunlight. The there is no possible. sunlight in the middle of the night. <laughs> this is just full of blown nodes, this formation. <laughs> You're full of blown nodes. Right? Stick it up his nose, so please. Blown node? No, you just broke that with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear me. Broken down into farce yeah, in this circle. Node there. In order to get anything done in Wiltshire during crop circle season, you have to have um, a connection. You have to have a man on the ground. And for us, that was Charles Mallet. All right.
So uh, this formation here that we're about to enter, this was made for National Geographic TV last night in right. the construction team of humans. This was their attempt to show that people can make crop circles and by implication that will suggest that all crop circles are man-made. These people are supposed to be the best circle fakers in the business. Immediately I would be wondering why plants are out of the ground. <laughs> heavy, heavy crushing, heavy mud on the plants. I can tell you that from this, just from this one plant, that's the, that's the um, width of their board. These aren't even, these, these bends, they tend to happen wherever the board hit them. It's all different, it's all irregular. My understanding of the genuine um, nature of this phenomenon is that it does not go around killing plants. They, they lay over neatly and they keep on growing. That's the an only, excellent point. The only thing that happens, really, which kills the plants is subsequent visitors to the formation. You know, I would measure something like this is, you know, what, what do we say, it's 150 to 160 feet long in what, 15 to 20 circles, okay, this took four people, four hours. I would measure that against Milk Hill Crop Circle 2001. That, that formation appeared within a four hour window of opportunity through the hours of darkness. It was raining, it was raining last night when this thing was made, so it's a good measure. Uh, Milk Hill had 409 circles spread over 700,000 square feet, and that was clean on day one. Even though it was raining all night, it was clean, it was seamless, and it was precise, and it was massive, and it was over an undulating hilltop. Um, this is on dead flat ground. And I find it highly inconceivable that that could be done by humans. That's a complete impossibility. The amount of circles, just to walk them, would take a couple of days to just walk the, the surface area. I, I went out there while it was still sort of pristine, you know, before anyone had walked into it. And there was no evidence of any um, footprints, which there would have been because there was mud on my shoes. So, uh, so, I mean, you know, you do get the ones that can't be explained. I mean, I, I've never understood how anything as big as that can be made in such a short time. So, so Team Satan should be down here making the Milk Hill 409 to prove to us that they can do it, not making a scrappy 150 foot mess. Mathematics, that's what actually speaks to me. Yeah. Not people with, I made this last night after I fell out of the pub drunk, that's just not convincing. <laughs> it is convincing in this case, maybe. They've just proven again for the fifth year or whatever it is that people can make crappy patterns in wheat. <laughs> big, big fucking deal. <laughs> For myself here in Wiltshire, for the 22 years I've been here, the area around Alton Priors, Alton Barnes, has been a focal point for designs to appear and at the sacred site of Avebury. This is Avebury, one of the oldest Neolithic stone circles in Europe and certainly the largest. You could actually fit two stone hinges in here and it's made of about 98 sarsen stones, some of them originally weighing up to 40 tonnes. If you take a GPS to the centre of Avebury Stone Circle, you will discover that you are precisely one-seventh of the way down from the pole. So the ancients seem to be able to position themselves extremely accurately on, on the earth. What one's left with the stone circles is, is a strange sort of sense of a culture for whom the motions of the heavens were, were very, very important. And what they seem to be trying to do was to create spaces on the ground that were sort of reflections of what was going on in, in the heavens. Stonehenge has uh, 29 and a half stones in its outer ring. The, the half width one's still there. Everyone says it has 30 stones, but if you look, there's one that's half the width of all the others. So the builders of Stonehenge clearly knew that there were 29 and a half days between full moons. All the circles are very close to Stonehenge and Avebury and, and this particular area, and I do find that a bit quite special and, and, and wonder why myself. So. And the fact that here in Wiltshire, where we have you know, more crop circles than anywhere else in the world, we also have some of the most important ancient sites in the world. You've got Avebury, you've got Stonehenge. It's drawn consciousness back to something bigger than ourselves. If you look at Wiltshire, northern Wiltshire, you will see there's a geometry in the landscape. And when you study that, you will see it's not just circles, there are also lines and there's a whole geometry that encloses a shape, a triangle, which is identical in slopes and angles to the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Like the pyramids, where the biggest and most complicated one, the Great Pyramid, goes up right at the beginning, you've got the biggest and most complicated stone circles going up right at the beginning, Avebury and Stonehenge. And they aren't typical as stone circles go, but they do involve huge amounts of astronomy and geometry. 
somehow both groups were fascinated by the same shape that encodes squaring the circle. And that makes it now really fantastic. Those things that motivated people to put up huge stones and build these incredible mounds like Silbury Hill, it's almost like it's trying to remind us there are bigger things than the materialistic world that we spin around us. We weren't always materialistic. We weren't always destructive on the planet. We had a quite different vision in the past, which was not, the, not dissimilar to the Egyptian and to the Indians, the ancient Indians you know, from India. We're the only race on the planet that does not revere their ancestors. We conducted about 14 stakeouts over the course of the investigation. That's 14 nights where we're, you know, instead of sleeping, we're disguised as bushes. We'd ambushed um, some sheep and some Spanish backpackers. Um, and I thought we were kind of working our way down the list and eventually we were bound to get to aliens. Uh, it's exhausting. The most exhausting thing is when you think you're not getting anywhere. But there was one location in particular that we had been saving and it was really, it's the daddy of all locations. If we were looking for like an epicenter of activity, it's this hill over here. Silver Hill is um very important monument. It is an ancient pyramid. It's not just a mound. It's not an earth mound. It's built in water. It's got its feet on water. It's a, it's a swamp. The pyramid was white. It's dressed stone. It's, it's hard chalk stone. And it shines. You know, it reflects the sun. That's why it's called sil. That means brilliant. It means light. As sol, you know, soleil, sun and it would have reflected the sunlight and would have reflected the moonlight. It would have been quite amazing. And actually, when you look at Silbury, sometimes you can see an aura around it. It does shimmer and, and shine in certain lights. And uh, therefore, it must have been a very shiny, very beautiful, white, six-level uh, circular pyramid. There are many pyramids that are circular. I think it acted as a kind of um, energy generator. The way it was built is, is very much like an energy generator. It created a good force which helped the cultures and it was all part of the, of the ancient belief system which was really based on uh, how to preserve life, how to encourage life. We have the opposite view now. The other aspect was that the culture that had a mound within their society was always richer than the culture that didn't. Look at Silbury Hill, for instance. We know that there's layers of like organic, non-organic material, and that creates a huge amount of energy. It's like an all-going accumulator. And then we have the Michael and Mary lines moving down the, the, the megalithic avenues into the main circle, which kind of moves the energy around. So they think it could have been used as the central point of southern England, which people will come for hundreds of miles around for, and do their sort of seed, uh, place their seeds in the right spot, and then go away and grow them. So. Crop circles appear to be bringing our attention back to megalithic sites and, and other ancient temples uh, across, especially Britain, really. I mean, although crop circles do appear, you know, sporadically in other countries, generally they seem to be in Britain. Avebury, Silbury Hill are, are really the kind of hub of where all this comes from. I had a dream, one night I had a dream, I had a picture of Silbury Hill, and in the corner of it, as those watching on television, there was a little calendar flipping, flipping down with numbers, and then it stopped on a particular day, I think it was the 26th of July or something, I may be completely wrong. Um, and I thought, I wonder if there's going to be a crop circle that night at Silbury Hill. Went and climbed up Silbury Hill. There was another guy up there, this was interesting, from Alaska. He had a dream that there'd be a crop circle at Silbury Hill that night. In the crappy world, things like this are not unusual, and you, you tend to sort of take them in your stride. And sure enough, as dawn broke, um, there was this vast great crop circle in the field opposite Silbury Hill.
it's July 5th, 5.50 a.m. We were staking out Silbury Hill last night. We had two men up there and two men on West Kennet Longbarrow. And as the light came up, our cameraman on Silbury noticed this formation. We didn't hear anything, we didn't see any lights. And we're pretty sure this is new and we're the first people in it. We had needed so badly something like that. Um, and here we had a brand new circle that had literally you know, crept under the radar while we were looking the other way. It just appeared seemingly. But we still don't really know what we've discovered. To this day, I don't know what it means. But the, we thought, well, potentially, if this is something that is some form of communication from anyone, you know, we should... Um, try and make contact ourselves, which had always been the plan anyway. And to do that, we brought back Peter Sorensen. How good is the man who claims to have made the pie circle? Peter showed up and we began what was essentially a crop circle school and for most of the day taught these kids how to make crop circles. So keep your eyes open because a lot of times Peter would agree. We do when see lights. Making, yeah, yeah. You see balls of light, weird things happen. One of you might go missing and come back looking 10 years older. <laughs> <laughs> We are out here making crop circles with this lovely board here. I, I, I quite like crop circles. I never really thought about how they originate and stuff. It's always just one of those things that kind of pops onto the news and you think, oh yeah, how do they do that? You know, where do they come from and that kind of thing. And I guess uh, this has just answered all my questions really. You know, um, I only have little legs and I'm only a small person. So holding holding this board and trying to fight against the crop was a bit difficult really but uh yeah overall an enjoyable experience i recommend it so yeah <laughs> i thought it was great um and that's about the time peter sent them all home and said i'm gonna do the circle myself which was concerning great view exactly you know terrific now hey peter <laughs> Maybe see that that, wow <laughs> that's what they look like that's the UFO that's going to make a crop circle. Great. This is the okay. center for making the spiral. Oh, I see. I'm not going to make, uh, I'm going to do it all with a stomping board. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. From the moment this project was conceived, this was always the plan to actually attempt contact. If this is a real phenomena, we always assumed we'd be able to make contact with whoever's making the circles. So right now out there, we have two hoaxers, Peter Sorensen and a guy called Jerry, and they're actually building our message to the stars, as we call it, which is laid down in Morse code and it's actually grid coordinates and a time for us to meet whoever's making the real circles. Yeah. 
One dot. Yep, this one. Okay, then a space. <laughs> nice one. And now we have our message down and hopefully we get a response. <laughs> So here we are, the morning after, having constructed our message in the crop. Now the idea is to wait and stake out this location on Wednesday morning to see if we can get some kind of reply. The only problem is, we laid this down in the middle of the night in Morse code. I'm hoping we didn't say anything too offensive. From the road, you can't see this circle. It's completely concealed at the foot of Woodborough Hill. So the only people who really know it's here would be up there. Stipulated that contact would be preferable, but really, uh, we could have uh, sent them a pizza order. We just have no idea if that Morse worked. The, the aliens are reading messages like, what? Why? <laughs> It's hard to say what really went wrong with the message to the stars, chiefly because none of us were ever actually able to read it. And I think that goes for any potential aliens as well. If anything, all we did was um, encourage aliens to invade, certainly from their perspective, the planet's inhabited by dyslexic morons. I've come to the end of my stay here in England. And I have to say, after two months, the crop circles have left me emotionally physically and mentally drained. I was sick of my every failure being carefully documented and replayed to me ad nauseum and things of that nature. It was too much, too personal, and I felt a lot of pressure. Like everyone was always watching me, um, waiting for me to make a profound statement or have an epiphany or lead them to the answer, and I didn't have a fucking clue. The harvest is the definitive end to the season. It literally sends you home. That's the end. Um, crop circles are temporary works of art. Back in Los Angeles, having been in 42 circles, I still really had more questions than answers. All we did have was the knowledge that at least one circle in the last two years, the Pi Circle, had encoded real mathematical information. And so I had to start looking retroactively at every crop circle ever photographed to see if perhaps there were other codes latent within those designs. And that was a pretty fruitless endeavor, and it went on for a couple of months and then everything changed. Some researchers have believed that the formations that we see are 
effectively two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional objects, and that if we could learn to create these three-dimensional objects, they might actually be showing us a new technology, be it anti-gravity, be it free energy or whatever. But certainly, yeah, it can't be ruled out that if we could decode some of this stuff, it might lead us on to some yeah, new technology that maybe is actually, it's a blueprint. I was contacted by a mysterious inventor by the name of Nikola Romansky, who sent me a very strange um, email. And when I opened this email, there was a video attached, and the video um, appeared to be Nikola's attempt using a simple Autodesk CAD program to decode a specific circle that had come down in 2009. But it seemed to harvest blueprints. There was some kind of machine we were staring at all of a sudden. And of course, my next question to Nicola was, what kind of machine do you think this is? And, and then eventually the conversation turned to, can we build this? I hadn't uh, talked to Charlie in a long time about the project. I didn't know, you know where they were. I didn't know what they were doing. I went over to Charlie's house one night. Um, I think we were going to watch a fight or something. I walked in, and there was this person there who I'd never met before. Um, this man with long blonde hair sitting on the couch in this like yoga pose. And I was like, oh, that's a new face. And, um, and I said, hi, I'm Dax, you know? And uh, Charlie was like, oh yeah, uh, Dax, this is Nicola. He's working on the project. He's really, he's so dedicated to this project. I said to him, uh, you sure you're ready for all that? He says, Mom, I was thinking about that kind of stuff my whole life long, you know. And finally, I get to express myself. So and finally, there's somebody that believes in the same thing I do. you can see the primary device of the reactants coupler with the water sphere at the top and the containment, inner containment chambers for processing down into the clistron, which is the tube here. And then you can see the field which comes off the clistron through the tachymetric converter, which is the green circle at the very center there. In here you can see the sacred mean to establish the geometry which is something that is a direct correlation with information decoded from the crop circles. Overall, the dynamic uh, is basically a power plant for alternative zero-point energy, uh, and uh, some people might effectively call it also a light-speed engine. I was on the phone one day with Charlie. I asked him how the machine was going, right? and, uh, and he freaked out. He's like, don't say the words of the machine. I said, don't say the words of the machine. He's like, stop doing that. When you're trying to build a device that is essentially an alternate energy uh, source, potentially, you kind of want to keep it on the down low, just in case it works. People tend to disappear. 
when they do this, when they challenge oil. I mean, it was a matter of life and death. They were convinced, you know, that they could be killed for trying to create this free energy device, right? That big oil was somehow going to send commandos, you know, um, through the windows with machine guns. And so I asked Nicole, I said, what should we call your machine? And he said, uh, easy, we'll call it sweet potato. I said, of course, it's sweet potato. I did ask Nicola why the machine was designated sweet potato. And he said, because the last one was called Queen. So there you go. It's pretty clear as far as I'm concerned. Finally, it was time to actually build the thing. You know, the talk is over. Time to build whatever the hell this is. Let's get busy. <laughs> As for the, you know, the nail polish and the, and the long hair, um, he's a, she's beautiful. As far as me going back and forth between the he and she, I've, I've grown up with him. I've known him my whole life as a him, even though I could tell that there were feminine aspects. Is some urge for him to behave like that, so if that's so. You better support it. Okay, so, so what we're looking at here, guys, is that these are the parts of um, sweet potato that have been milled so far um, from Nikki's CAD. Now, does this, ha does this run on any sort of fuel? It runs on saline water. Saline water. And that, do you need a lot of it? Um, not very much, no. Really? Okay. How many crop circle designs, roughly? are represented here? Uh, at this time, probably 11. Okay. I mean, is this thing, I mean, I have to ask, is this dangerous? I mean, do I want to call in sick that day or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, the, if the secondary disc is rotating at high speed and it fractures apart, it will go flying off like bullets. Yeah, radially. <laughs> okay. Yeah, also, if you happen to touch it or it bumps into you when it's up, up at full speed, when it's energized, you will explode. Well, I know how far back I'm going to be, but who's <laughs> going to switch it on? That would be me. In English, <laughs> what happens when we turn it on? <laughs> uh, I mean, do we lose time, or did, will a black hole emerge? Well, any number of things could happen. Uh, <laughs> some potentially I like <laughs> catastrophic, others not catastrophic. Well, well what's, the, what's your biggest fear that might happen? Could we end up in 13th century France, for instance? <laughs> I do not think so, no. Okay. So we're building a UFO, basically. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> After a year of working on Sweet Potato, um, it didn't feel like we'd made an enormous amount of progress. We had, as far as I can tell, one usable part. It was thrilling to hold in your hands something that could have been designed by a circle maker but at the same time, discouraging because it was costing so much every day and we were really moving at a glacial pace. We had always intended to try and build the machine in-house, take care of all the needs ourselves 
um, because we thought then we can control both the schedule and the budget. Nicola suggested that we might want to consider buying a rapid prototyper, also known as a milling machine. Unfortunately, Nicola um, had not done his homework. Um, he was incorrect. We could not build the parts that he said we could with the milling machine. And so we wound up having to outsource anyway. So I think, yeah, we were concerned, but we also understood this has never been done before. No one's tried this. You know, we're kind of idiot trailblazers. Let's, you know, not beat ourselves up too much. Let's just try and make it happen. Antonio Acuna, and I'm, I'm working here, <laughs> right? <laughs> when I, when the first time I saw the, the print from Nicola, well, I was thinking it's crazy. Well, I've heard before I started working on it through the project that we were going to be building a UFO, and I kept telling that to people that walked by and asked me what I was doing. They would say, no, no, what are you really doing? <laughs> We're gonna make some toys for my son. My son. <laughs> Originally, I'll just have basic geometry, but, but then as I asked the computer to give me dimensions, it will find errors, and it did. Your initial radius had two different centers, which would, would cause a skew in, into your rotation. Okay. So when we identified that, then that's, that's where we, we were looking here, and you can see they're both coming from the straight, same center. Yeah. And if you guys hadn't caught this, we'd have serious problems with wobble on our rotating yeah, you know, right. discs. And, yeah. and you could have had clearance issues because it might have been going right. out long yeah. again. Right. So. so what's the next step, Jim, from here? Now I can use this, this file and give it to my operator, send it electronically, and now all the math is done, so all they're doing is just uh, forming their toolpath. <laughs> talk when I'm talking then. Don't start talking while I'm not ready. <laughs>
It's December 8th, 2011. We're here at Ritec in Simi Valley, where we're going to pick up one of the most important components of sweet potato, a piece known as the secondary plate. Gotta do one, wait an hour, do another one, wait an hour, do another one, wait an hour. Is that fully seated in the group? No, it's the torsion swinging it out. Ah! Well, if that was those big four inches, I would have lost my finger. Whoever can get those back gets $100 cash. Right now. Okay. Now, don't let go. God, you're going to slice my finger up if you let go. All right. What, what am I doing here? Okay, when I say pull, pull. Okay, I got my... <sighs> okay, stop. Watch your fingers. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Put it in a vise. Haha, <laughs> you did it. Sweet. Congratulations, man. December 15th, here we are at Ritec to pick up the final parts for sweet potato. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> to officially, the last piece is from Ritec. Yeah. So what's next? 15 minutes for the black stuff to dry, an hour and a half for the other shit. I would say that 75% of the time that Nicola was working on sweet potato, that time was devoted to curing, which is a big fancy word for letting glue dry. What are my thoughts on curing? I never want to wait for anything to ever dry ever again because um, there were so many times in the production where we had to simply sit around and wait for stuff to glue together. Hello, January 23rd, and we are, of course, still in the workshop. Um, this week, as we did last week, working on the copper coil um, installment, and um, we actually have about a week left uh, of assembly time according to our schedule, so we're hoping to meet that deadline. Whoa, what just happened there? Too much voltage. <laughs> Jesus. If you say the deadline's a week, that's coming really fucking close. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> Seriously. But it's always been that's always been the deadline. I mean, this is not a surprise. Well, it bothers me because it's like I'm very concerned that I can't make the deadline. Well, how far off the deadline do you think we are? <sighs> I cannot say for certain. Yeah, yeah, honestly, Nicole, like, I'm, I'm, we, look, I'm not even mad. I'm just like, yeah. how are we going to finish? Yeah. On and, time? and the other that's, thing is... That's like, starting to come up on me, too. It's like... So let's figure out right now how we can how we can do it. You look, look how far you've gotten there. Do you really want to do? I mean, no, I don't. give yourself the best so fucking. Close. It's so close. Give yeah. yourself a chance, Nikki. There was a tremendous amount of tension, and we were all very worried because we realized we were running out of time. Is there anything again though that that we could do? I mean, do you need help with anything? Yeah, um, somebody you can solder for a day. So after these are done, though, they're pretty much ready to mount as far as 
rest of the disc goes. Huh? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, what, what's your mounting technique? Uh, JB Wild. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. None of it worked when I first came on board. There was nothing working. Uh, there were some electrical engineering red flags that just you kind of instinctively want to prepare for. Phil really enabled us to get a good sense of where we were as opposed to where we wanted to be. Okay, it's the 26th, Charles. January the 26th. Here we are in the workshop, Kelsa Breeze. And as you can see, something's happening. Uh-oh. What? By far the worst Indian food I ever had. Totally recycled crap. Some people, I guess, just don't know what Indian food should be. Okay, in addition to lunch, Charles, what's the plan for today? Nicola, what's the plan for today? Keep working on shit. Okay, that was a truly shit update. January the 30th, 2012. Here we are in the workshop, the final stages of assembly. And um, we have our Uncle Phil has come to give us a, a hand just down the stretch and is really helping uh, pick up the pace here so it's been fantastic having Phil. Oh, isn't this? Oh man, that's why it's nice <laughs> again. It's not plugged in. Brilliant. Yeah. Look at that, it's crikey. So the vapor goes through that copper tube? It will go through the copper tube yeah. from the tube that yeah. comes from the compressor. Gotcha. And then, it, and then it hits the spark plug and is ignited into plasma? Correct. Okay. Got it focused? Stay outside. And pull up and ready to go. Yep. So here it is. Have we? Nothing. Right. Okay. Check these connections to be sure. Just in case something's going on. Nice. I have to go now because the cops are coming, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just try this, I'll be right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you said they stopped making until you had that voltage meter on it yesterday. Yeah, but it worked after that, right? Right? Mm-hmm. Right. Nothing. Why is it not sparking? So if we see explosions today, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. If they're small, and don't take the room out. Before you touch it, you should always have me power the power down. Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Maybe. Is that a plasma flame? That's a plasma. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Inside of a shot glass. <laughs> when you see the orange flashes, that's water burning. Right. Whatever you've got there, keep it going. It's sweet. Jeez, look at that. When we saw that little orange spark, there, w there was a real reason to, to celebrate. The day started with the plasma ignition system firing, which was a first. So the core, the heart of sweet potato, had actually briefly started to beat. That was thrilling. So you can imagine my surprise when, after going home for the day, I got a call from Charlie that evening, and he said that he'd shut down the film. Uh, I remember walking Phil to the car at the end of the workday and taking him aside and saying, how, how close are we really to testing this machine? And he said about $100,000 and several hundred thousand more volts. You know, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that maybe filmmakers shouldn't be doing this. 
Um, I then asked Nicola and he said six or seven more months on the project. And I was actually told by the investors that there was no more money forthcoming. So it was a very simple decision. We had failed. It was over. When my family and friends found out that I was living with a transsexual man under the pretenses of building a UFO, they were understandably very disturbed. Yeah, people tended to think that I had gone off the deep end and come out of the closet at the same time. There's enlightened, there's esoteric, there's wacky, and then there's plain nuts. And the question is, where is Charlie in this scale? Obviously, it could have been better and it could have been worse, but I think for all intents and purposes, I didn't do that badly. And I sympathize with him because he's a human. At the end of the day, it's heartbreaking for him too. If there's something that you believe in, you have to, you know, fight the good fight and find out. And even if people are going to question you and ridicule you, 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 you keep fighting for the answers. And what lessons did Charlie learn from this documentary, you know? And will he become more militant and more esoteric in his beliefs going forward? Or will there be some humility and acknowledgement? That, to me, is a more interesting process. When we began the project, especially the construction of sweet potato, we thought we were the only people trying this on the planet. That is, extrapolating data from crop circles, trying to turn it into a, some kind of over-unity device, an alternate energy source. Turns out we actually were wrong. Um, there was someone else at least attempting this, who's based out in Hawaii. After learning that, it was a no-brainer. There was only one thing left to do. I had to go to Hawaii. When we looked at crop circles, um, we thought we saw um, information there as well that was technical in nature. We then went ahead and, and did something totally insane and tried to design a machine that incorporated those elements. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen bits of that machine and mm -hmm. you know that it didn't end exactly the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Did I waste my time? Absolutely not. You know, um, first of all, you know, in science, there is no such thing as wasting your time. I mean, Edison made thousands of light bulbs before the first one worked. And when he was asked about that, he said, well, you know, I learned thousands of ways not to make a light bulb. And, and that's part of the research process. And when I look at you guys' device and what you extrapolated from the crop circle, um, I think you guys were right on track to what is being um, conveyed by the crop circle. That is that fundamental spin is important, that, the, that there is a fundamental spin in the universe and that when you understand that you can build devices to interact with the universe and to reproduce those in laboratory in a small environment in a low energy setting and see if we can tap into this fundamental energy, if we can reproduce the dynamics 
of creation that are found in the universe. If you went to that beach where the Wright brothers flew the first plane, and you went to the neighborhood and you start to tell people, you know, in two weeks, somebody's gonna come here with some crazy apparatus that weighs thousands of pounds, and it, they're gonna lift themselves off the ground with this thing, their own weight plus the weight of the device, just by pushing wind over it. You know, everybody would have told you, you're crazy, that's not gonna happen. In fact, at the time, hundreds of physics papers were published in the mainstream scientific community, categorically proving that that could not be done. And even after it was done, it was called a hoax for years by the scientific community, which said, you see, here is the calculation, that cannot be done, therefore this must be a hoax. You know, it's a little bit like that today. You know, it's hard for people to visualize what it would be to have gravitational control, to have, you know, a car that levitates. Success of our civilization, I think, weighs in the balance. I still believe in what Nikola was trying to do. You know, I've always said, I don't think the universe runs on gasoline. You know, how does the universe do what it does? If we can look at that and, and, and replicate it, imitate it, perhaps we'll have success there in terms of alternate energy sources. And even if it isn't, isn't it worth one idiot, you know, wasting his time to find out? I think it is. So this is where our journey has to end, in the middle of the Pacific. It's a long way from the Pi Circle of Barbary Castle. And some might say it's all been a giant waste of time. But I like to believe that we're one of Edison's thousand light bulbs. As I speak here on the beach, the circles are appearing again in Wiltshire. Perhaps this time it'll be your turn. You ready for the next one? Next one what? Yeah, the next adventure. There's a lot more out there. There are no more adventures. No, 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 no. There are. We just have to find them. For instance, I know you've always had a thing for Bigfoot. We're not, but you want to do a documentary about Bigfoot? No, I've no interest in doing it. I want to capture Bigfoot. 